The biggest difference is that in Cuba, the drive is people before profits, where in the United States, it's profits before people. You were recently, you recently went to Cuba and uh, what, what did you go there for? I went to Cuba to, to uh, participate in the uh, international meeting of uh, communist and workers parties, which meets annually. Uh, uh, It's consistent of uh, communist parties, communist and workers parties, Marxist Leninists that follow the Marxist Leninist line. Mm -hmm. So this year, uh, Cuba uh, hosted it. And so um, that's where we all met. Was this the first time that you had visited Cuba? No, no, it's the second time. Yeah, okay. I, I went, um, geez, I don't remember now. Some time ago, you know, with COVID, you kind of lo- lo- lose track of uh, years. <laughs> yeah. So uh, on this particular visit, you went... Uh, as, and represented the Communist Party USA. Yes. And what uh, what kind of sense did you get from the other participants there at the at the conference? Um, that sort of was. What were the most pressing issues that the uh, the delegations were facing? Uh, well, scarcity. Uh, concern for the war, you know, will it escalate? Um, <clears throat> of course, uh, the fight against imperialism and U.S. imperialism in particular, and the importance of uniting on on those um, uh, on the issues that that we are we have in common, such as imperialism, and uh, and unite on uh, around those issues. Were there talks specifically about? some of the problems related to the the blockade? Oh, very much so. You can see it all around you. You know, the scarcity, the lack of uh, resources that uh, Cuba has been denied in terms of just, you know, car parts and access to, um, a- access to different uh, things, even just as simple as aspirin, hmm. you know, um, Things like that 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 uh, have been uh, they don't have a, a a lot of access to things like that that uh, that will help will benefit the uh, the Cuban people because you know they don't have access to the dollar and the dollar is the one that can buy. Yeah, and that has been that has been the case since the beginning, right? Since the since Kennedy put the embargo in place, right? So. I think a lot of, especially like younger and newer members of of CPUSA, when we talk about Cuba, it's just shocking for for us to to think about that this Cold War era blockade, these sanctions are still in place. And I wonder if you could talk maybe about some of the justifications we hear. I know you know we had started to see some really kind of baby steps when Obama was in office. And then when Trump came in, obviously he doubled down and, and reversed that. But I mean, what are we hearing from our government in terms of why why we're continuing to do this? Well, I mean, it's all propaganda with that that is baseless. It's not based on anything. And I encourage folks to go to Cuba and and really witness it for themselves. For example, you know, they put um Cuba on the terrorist list. Well, that's ridiculous. If you go to Cuba, you can you can uh, come back and and I'll ask you how many police officers did you see in Cuba. Secondly, if you saw police officers, you'll see they don't even carry guns. You know, they don't haul people out and drag them uh, with, uh, in a way that 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 is inhumane, like we see here. Nothing like that happens. I witnessed the. Uh, Two police officers uh, guiding uh, a, a citizen into the police car because he was drunk, and so they wanted to just get him off the street. 
They had no guns, no billy clubs. It was more like, come on, you know, let's go sober you up somewhere where you can't hurt yourself and or, you know, bother other people. But that's about it. You know, so it's really ludicrous to put a country as small as Cuba um, uh, in the terrorist list when, like I said, you don't see anybody carrying a gun, not even the police. I saw maybe 10 police officers uh, while I was this this last time. The time before that, I only saw two. Uh, but this last time there was 10. And the reason why I saw 10 was because they were the ones who were escorting the buses to and from the whole, you know, uh, the venue and the hotel back to the hotel. Uh, transportation was provided. And so they, you know, that was it. Mm. They had no guns, no billy clubs, you know. When it was time to eat, we all sat together, <clears throat> including the police officers, including mm-hmm. any staff that was there um, helping with the event. So it's really ludicrous. But if you have not traveled there, it's easy to believe, you know, mm-hmm. because you don't know any better, you know. So I think that that uh, tra- if you're able to travel there, if you're not able to travel, do some research. You'll find the, that um, it's it's really a, a, a ludicrous thing. But the question then becomes, why such a propaganda against Cuba? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I can tell you why, if that's if that's okay for yeah, that's <laughs> you know? so. The reason why they do this is because if you go to Cuba, you will see a people that are willing to share anything and everything they've got. Even given the scarcity that they experience, they're still very giving. They're still very sharing. There's not this this uh, doggy dog kind of atmosphere. Uh, you see, you see the mothers without that stress on their faces that you see here. Why? Because they don't have to worry about whether their child is going to have an education, whether their child is going to have shoes, whether their child is going to have health care because it gets sick, and whether they're going to have food on the table. Their food on the table may be limited, but nonetheless, they will have food. And they will know that everybody else in the country is eating pretty much the same. Um, mm. This last time when I was there, uh, I was told there's a scarcity of bread right now. So everyone is allotted one loaf of bread a day. I think it's a day <clears throat> or twice a week. I don't, I don't really remember. But everybody gets it. You know. Now, if you compare that to this country, the United States, the richest in, country in the world, supposedly, why can't we have that here? There is no reason other than the, the the biggest difference is that in Cuba, the drive is people before profits, where in the United States, it's profits before people. And never mind, I don't care who I step on, I'm going to make my money. Whereas in Cuba, we're all in this together. We're working together. We're, you know, we're dealing with the scarcities and the issues, but all together, we're a community. And you know, at the end of the day, we are human beings, but we're communal animals. We mm-hmm. gather in community. We thrive in community, and and so we're we're totally denied that here. We're always put in competition with each other. We don't want, you know, we're 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 made to feel fearful of each other and not trusting, um, you know, the rumors and the and the brainwashing and the propaganda all kind of point to you first and nobody else and forget everybody else. And so that's okay. In Cuba, that's not the case. So the question then is, if you un, if you know that a different society is possible, a different system is possible, then you're going to want it. And what's that going to do for those uh, less than 1% who are uh, you know, just hoarding all that money. What's it going to do? You know, people are going to stand up and and fight to <clears throat> to get their fair share, and you know, and to eliminate this this drive for profits. And that's why there's such a strong propaganda against Cuba. Same in China, Vietnam, all of these countries that are moving in the direction of a path towards socialism, a path towards equality, 
true equality, not this pseudo equality that we are we are um, made to believe. You know, we don't have equality here in the United States. Okay. But in you know when, <clears throat> and you define equality by being able to to know that that your neighbor, to know that your your fellow fellow men and women have what you have, and have the opportunities that you have. And that's not the case here, not the case here at all. It's yeah, it's just unbelievable. I think like to to realize that when you once you once you realize that that there's it's not this authoritarian dictatorship regime where anybody who disagrees with the government is getting sent to concentration camps and things like that. And once you realize it, then you start to question. So then why? Why is my government, why is the United States continuing this this blockade? And it almost sounds to me like like what you're saying is that they don't want us to see the reality because then we know that, hey, they're doing that. Why can't we do that here? Exactly. You know, it's it, exactly it. You know, it would alleviate a lot of people who are depressed because they've lost hope. You know, it, would, it gives people hope. I know that when I first heard, when I first started learning about Marxism, Leninism, it was it was the hope that I had been looking for, that there is a possibility of a change. There is a possibility of, um, of uh, a new system, a new way of life. And yes, it's going to take a fight. Yes, it's going to take time, but it is possible. And so there is hope. And so, um, and and now we have, you know, we have proof. Not, not, I'm not, I'm not saying that things are perfect. No, you know, uh, we all make mistakes or anything like that. But it's it's the best. It's the better way for all of us. For you know, for the for all of humanity. Because they're very conscious about the environment, they're very conscious about making sure everybody go, doesn't go. You know, everybody has what they need, and um, and then uh, and and then feeling like they belong. And in the mm -hmm. United States, many many of us do not feel like we belong anywhere. You know, because we have so many other challenges, and we're told, you know, it's. It's either if you didn't find a job after you had college and everything like that, then it's your fault. You don't belong. You don't, you know, it's all of it is your fault. And so that's that's the problem with uh with our society. But there is hope, and that's the that's the you know, that's the best part of it. Yeah. And I think that's the part that we can see a lot of a lot of people can struggle with that, especially after you know, disappointing elections here in the United States. I mean, I'm in Texas and we saw just a complete wipeout of the GOP just, you know, dominated. And and now we're seeing the the repercussions of that. With governor, our governor is declaring an invasion at the southern border. I mean, it just feels like there is this strong lack of empathy and compassion. And it's totally to, in my opinion, that's that's the result of capitalism. It's alienated yeah. us from our, our fellow humans. And exactly. And it's and it has sucked out resources in all over the world. You know, <clears throat> it's why so many people, um, so many people um have to travel outside of their country. If you just stop to think about why anybody would travel 2,000 miles pretty much on foot to come here, you know, it's not because they're crazy. It's not because of anything else other than they're hungry. They've lost, you know, what little semblance of life over there in their own country is because they, they can't feed their families. And so they make that sacrifice. And some of them make the sacrifice, not just for themselves, but for their entire family that stays behind and is counting on some resources from them. And so it's it's not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, the immigrants, you know, the, from Italy and from Hungary and from other European countries, when they came here, it was the same thing under the same conditions. Mm -hmm. They were hungry. They needed, you know, uh, <clears throat> they were looking for a better life, you know, a better life for their families. They didn't just leave their hometown, things that they're familiar with, their community and everything. 
out of greed. It was out of necessity. And it's the same thing all over the world. All those, you know, everybody who's uh, immigrants that are leaving their countries, it's for the same reason. And I think that, you know, we have to, we have to be more humane about, about what we uh, agree with and what we don't agree with, you know, and, and, and we have to do something about it because there is a fight back. It just takes, you know, it takes a little time. And it takes work. Mm -hmm. Sacrifice on our own part, too. So that's a perfect segue to my next question with regard to, like, what can we as American, you know, you, you, United States communists here in the kind of imperial core, what are some things we can do to combat this type of propaganda that we're seeing against Cuba specifically? Well, let, let me tell you another aspect of Cuba before I answer that question, if that's okay. okay. You know, I, when when I was there, um, the day before the meeting was to start, it's a two-day meeting, by the way, but the day before that, they took us on a tour. One was of the Castro Center, which is uh, Fidel Castro Center, and it's pretty much the history of, of Cuba and the revolution and, and, and Fidel Castro's involvement in it. It's a, it's a really beautiful uh, museum that has a lot of um, of the historical right, his writings. It has a lot of pictorial kinds of uh, history. And actually it's going to be uh, online on November 25th. It's gonna go online so that anyone in the world can visit it and learn about Cuba, learn about the struggle and on all of that. But the second place they took us was to the Biotechnical and, in, and Genetic Engineering Institute. And that's one of about 30 institutes that deals with uh, development, scientific development, with uh, medications. Um, and once again, these institutes don't compete with each other. What they do is they each collaborate one component in developing, for example, when they develop the, the COVID, the vaccine for COVID, which is which is superior to to the majority of of covid vaccines in the world it's already been determined that it's mm -hmm. not something that they are saying it's the world that is saying that to the point where the vaccine when you take it if you're immunized and you come in contact with covid you don't carry that covid virus to anyone else that's how that vaccine works mm -hmm. it's amazing you know they have uh, created a medication that um, uh, prevents ulcers, foot ulcers developing in people with diabetes. They have created a vaccine that, a treatment, a cancer treatment for lung cancer that treats the lung cancer, but doesn't damage the rest of the cells in the body. Hmm. They have developed tumor reducing medication. They're in the process of <clears throat> I don't remember what stage they're in this, but it's pretty uh, advanced stage of developing an anti-inflammatory anti medication, which in many cases is what begins that process of any kind of disease. And they're in the process of developing all of these. They're, you know, they're, they're, um, their doctors are far superior. You, we, you can only, you know, if you go to the uh, people's world and, and look up the Ebola, the, the contribution to fighting Ebola, you can just see how advanced they they train doctors from all over the world uh, for free. Mm -hmm. You know, in many times um, they're just the the students are asked to pay for their boarding, but the schooling the education is free, and they are all they're asked is that at least they dedicate two years of their lives to a community in their own in their home country. That's the only requirement. So it's not just about providing what Cuba needs. It's about opening up the, the and ending the blockade because Cuba has a lot of what the world needs. Mm -hmm. I sat there and I thought about my brother-in-law who died of lung cancer. I thought about my niece who died of breast cancer and how if they had been, if these medications were available to them, they would still be alive today. And mm -hmm. so it's it's what you know the world is being denied with the blockade. So I think it's it's a twofold thing, you know. And I think that it's it's not just about 
helping poor Cuba. It's about allowing Cuba to help the world because they have the most advanced medicines, advanced doctors. With, with, with the little that they have in terms of resources, they have been able to develop phenomenal kinds of medications and treatments. And I can't remember them all, but but so so it's not uh, so it, it's important for that reason as well. So I think the 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 way to combat and to try to push pressure is on both ends, on what Cuba is being denied, but also what the world is being denied that Cuba has to offer for for all of us. That's it's it's amazing to hear that you know what what can be possible when we work together towards you know bettering humanity as opposed to bettering shareholders profits exactly but we're not used to that in this country but no. we have to you know i think as communists we have to make the shift and learn how to work together learn how to to talk to each other and you know iron out whatever differences we may have for the good of all which is what Cuba does. It's what Cuban people do. And so I think that that's one, that's one of the important steps for us in, here in the United States. Of course, there's always, uh, uh, you know, holding what do you call teachings about what is Cuba, you know, but not just about poor Cuba, but also putting that aspect out that, that what Cuba has to offer the world. By the way, I just remembered, you know, they're, <clears throat> they have a whole section on, on uh, treatment of animals, uh, curing, you know, the different diseases that animals, such as, you know, a livestock, sheep, you know, even, even probably your, your, your pet at home, uh, they, they, you know, if your pet at home gets sick, I mean, tumors, tumor reducing, mm -hmm. how many dogs get tumors, you know, they, they do. Yeah. And so, so it's not just, you know, it's, it's not a small thing that we're being denied because of this blockade. It's a big thing. You know, it's costing lives. What do you think it will take to get the blockade lifted? Anything, any change, any fundamental change takes a mass movement. Mm -hmm. And and that's so true. I witnessed this, you know, during the apartheid period of South Africa. I mean, you know, Nelson Mandela was in jail for 27 years. Hmm. And the movement to free him, you know, mounted and mounted over those 27 years. Little by little, it grew and grew and grew and grew. Finally, he was released. <clears throat> and not just he was released, but <clears throat> apartheid was declared, you know, uh, illegal. And voting among African Black Africans uh, was allowed. And I remember seeing those those um, lines of that first election when the, uh, Mandela was elected. Long, long lines of people exercising their right to vote because they knew the struggle. They knew what it took. They knew how many lives were lost. And so they were out to vote. They went out to vote and voted, you know, and, and then Mandela became president. Mm -hmm. You know, so you <clears throat> if you think about that, when you think it's the impossible, oh no, he's in jail forever. And so if that's you, you know, people must have thought, well, there's that's it. That's there's no fight, you know, because he's in jail or whatever, that kind of thing. He's never gonna come out of jail. But dialectics tells us, and historical materialism tells us that as the movement grows, and we help the movement grow, we continue to help, you know, and then we have to be patient sometimes. We help this movement grow it will mount to the point where it could be so strong that it can topple anything. And so I think that that's what's going to take to end the blockade and end the injustice that has been placed on, on the Cuban people and, like I said, and the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just thinking about some of the justifications, and we're I think we're just about wrapped up, but just like the justifications that I saw in the latest uh, article that was talking about this blockade was where the U.S. government is saying, you know, they always do this thing with human rights whenever they're justifying any kind of sanctions and, you know, the human right to life, like to 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 eat 
and to have a roof over your head and to have medicine. It just seems like maybe that's the the pseudo the pseudo equality you were talking about that you know we we see them as well they're they don't have the same system we have, so it's their human rights are not as good. Well, that's what we're led to believe. But you know, all I have to do is look out my window and I see the inhumanity that exists in the United States. Mm -hmm. Homeless people all, you know, laying down, pitching tents, you know, uh, very ill, mentally ill in some cases. Uh, people trying to make ends meet in whatever way, selling, you know, food on the streets, things like that. Um, uh, so, so you know, that's that's the humanity. But again, I really want to stress that there is hope. There is change. There is possible change. We cannot lose hope because we lose hope, then we just give, you know, give in to the forces and, and you know, we'll be hunting the streets as well. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, there is a fight back. There is hope. We just have to mount it and work steadily towards it. And the struggle is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Right. And sometimes it takes little quantitative changes and, you know, that leads to qualitative changes. And that's yeah. what we learn in our, when we read our, our theory, but yeah. It, and we it, study history as well. History shows us that it's real. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that uh, it, for the immediate issues that we're, that we're seeing with just how the entire world, with the exception of the United States and Israel, has has voted. You know, for the past thirty years, they've condemned this blockade. They've said this is not this is not right, and we don't need this. Um, there are some lawmakers here that are, you know, in, on our side with this that are that are working to to lift the blockade. So I think that there is hope, and I think that's the problem. That's the part a lot of people don't see is that we we want to fix it immediately and you know with our the way our system works and sometimes doesn't work it it takes it takes time and i think that we can pressure our representatives maybe to to look yeah, at we have, you know we have to understand that our battle as communists and as activists it's in the battle of ideas you know the propaganda is thick so we have to try to find ways to undo that propaganda. And it doesn't have to just be, you know, webinars or things like that. It can be football games or soccer games or whatever kinds of other activities, sewing, sewing circles, stuff like that, that, you know, where you have the opportunity to just talk about things mm -hmm. and have the opportunity to be a little relaxed where people, uh, you gain the trust of people in your community. And you do that, you know. And then, of course, you know, voting is so important here. It really is. People have died because, you know, they they fight for the right to vote, you know, and and especially for women. And so, and and who we elect as legislators does make a difference, you know. It may not make the difference that we want to see, and they may represent capital in some ways, but you know, we can also pressure them to to be able to push some of, some of this legislation because they, you know, we, we, we voted them in and we can vote them out, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they know that, you know, so I think it's, we can't underestimate, can't underestimate the power of propaganda, the power of the right. We can't underestimate the power of the vote. All of them are part of the fight back. It's, the vote is not solely the only fight back, but that's part of it. And we have to utilize everything that we have to to fight back and to and to gain to make gains in 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 our society to build that mounting road towards socialism even here in the United States. Well, thank you so much, Rosanna, for for talking with me. And if, was there anything else from your trip you wanted to highlight? Anything that really struck out at you or big takeaways? Well. One thing is, if you go to Cuba, don't forget to visit their beaches. Mm. <laughs> They're just so beautiful, clear water, peaceful. I, I had an opportunity to to hang out at the beach for a little while and and just relax, feel the 
you know, I felt like I had um, surfaced from out of the belly of the beast mm. and breathed some fresh air for a little while, some true freedom and 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 recharge my battery so that I can continue here in the US in, in the fight back. That's how I felt. <laughs> Maybe it's a little corny, but you know, <laughs> but it's like a really refreshing experience and a and a good way to kind of get back some some of that hope because it's easy yeah. I think for us to fall into cynicism and 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 that's a dangerous path. Yes. Exactly. Well, that's great. I'm so glad that we were able to connect, and um, it's an honor to have you on as our as our first guest. Well, I hope I was I, w- I was helpful. Absolutely. Hopefully, yeah. we we can do our part to at least get more people thinking and asking the right questions. Every attempt helps. It mm-hmm. makes a difference. It really does. 